Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Tracy Harris, and this is At Home in My Head, the podcast that explores experience and meaning and their impact on individuals and the broader society. For many years, every fall, I would rent a local cabin at a Texas state park on a lake. The park features cabins, lodges, group facilities, large group stone benches, paved roads, and something called the Grand Staircase, which early visitors to the park climbed when they arrived by boat to attend dances at the pavilion. It sounds odd for a park to list benches as a feature, but when you see these benches, you'll understand. These are no ordinary benches. They're actually features scattered throughout the park, some encircling fire pits, some blocked around actual outdoor stone chimneys. I've found large stone dining tables with seating on paths in the woods. It's magical to be on a hike and stumble on some of these things out in the middle of nowhere. For a while, the park was starting to fall into disrepair. I remember asking if the situation was the result of funding problems but they explained it was actually tied to the fact that they needed very specific work done in order to maintain the authenticity of the historic buildings and fixtures. When we came back after the work was done, it was nice to see some of these old structures patched back up and fixtures replaced. There's a gorgeous old boat dock that's in various states of under and above the water, where you can go and watch the sunrise over the lake, early ducks flying overhead and the occasional fish jumping, Be sure and take your coffee in a thermos because you'll need it to keep it hot in the chilly November morning air. I remember the first time I visited the park. I don't think I'd ever rented a cabin before. In fact, I wasn't that into camping, but I did like to do long hikes. After this visit, though, I would go on to start tent camping, primitive cabin camping, cooking on a Coleman stove, and generally just doing more long outdoor excursions to places like Caprock Canyon or Paladuro. But I talked in the last episode about my former husband's cancer. When he got sick, I was mostly working and stressing over money. I still wanted to do the sorts of things we'd done while dating, mainly outdoor activities. But he wasn't well enough to do them. So I looked online and I joined a group that did volunteer trail maintenance work. I did this for a while and met some new people, one of whom I'm still in touch with decades later. But I felt guilty about it because I felt like I was able to go and enjoy the outdoors in a way that my husband at the time could not. I wanted him to also be able to enjoy the outdoors, but I didn't know how to do that since outdoor activities are often physically taxing. Even a short hike would be an effort for someone who was so sick that they rarely left their bed. At some point, though, I found these cabin rentals online. I still remember that it was just $35 a night plus tax and a park entry fee both of which were minimal. I clicked the link and looked at the photos. It was rustic, but certainly not rough. The smallest cabins were designed as efficiencies. They were built of stone and wood with a small kitchenette and bathroom with a toilet and a shower, a wood-burning fireplace inside, and a fire pit and seating outside. It included a bed with linens and towels, and even by standards back then, $35 a night was a steal. So I asked my husband if he would like to go because I thought it would be a good way for him to be outside and enjoy nature and still have all the comforts of a modern space. He was interested but skeptical. I remember him telling me that for that price it couldn't be very nice. I showed him the images and he said that if it really was as nice as it looked then it was worth doing. I had no way to know if the photos reflected reality but it was so cheap and it was something he would enjoy so I made the reservation. It was between two and three hours to get there by car. We brought camp gear in the form of kitchen and dinnerware, toiletries, clothing, firewood, and food. There was a sleepy little town not far from there where we knew we could pick up other things if anything else was needed. When we arrived, we had to stop at the camp entrance to check in and get a tag for the car. We were given a map of the park layout, including the cabins, and asked which cabin we wanted. We said we were hoping for a quiet and secluded space where we could relax. They recommended cabin one, so we took the keys, paid the ranger, and drove off into the park. The road wound around the forest, went past some pretty cool large stone buildings, pavilions, fields, and structures. Now and then we could see the lake. And finally, we made it to the camp loop. When we pulled down the side road for cabin one, we realized that we couldn't see the cabin from the parking area. 
It was down a slope, and the roof barely peeked over the paved area where we parked the car. There were carved stone steps leading down to the front door. Because of the way it was situated with a long winding staircase, it was definitely private, but also a chore to carry down the gear. So I did the hauling of the stuff while my husband went in and looked around. The cabin was everything they described online, including the photos. It was perfect. Very rustic, but also very accommodating. So we set up house there for the weekend. He was able to sit outside in the camp chair and watch the water and the trees. There was wildlife that came around every night, raccoons and foxes with an occasional possum and armadillo. It made me feel good to know that he was able to have this at least. That no matter how strapped we were financially, there was an affordable option to give him a piece of the things that he loved the most, things that we couldn't get back in our one-bedroom apartment with views of streets and parking lots. When you're in the park, you can't help but notice the architecture. The buildings are mainly locally sourced stone, and even though it was built in the 1930s, you can still tell how solid everything is. It has a very heavy masonry look to it, with a lot of ironwork as well. The entire time we were married, we came back to the lake every year for our anniversary in November, the same as we did that first year when he was sick. We even expanded the event once we got through the cancer and started inviting more friends. The park had a number of lodges made of stone and wood, and one was an old lake house with five bedrooms and two baths, also had a kitchen and a range, a fridge, a coffee maker, and a microwave. We did a lot of fire cooking, storytelling, reminiscing, drinking, exploring in the over 500 acres of wildlands along the lake. It was rustic for sure. It was definitely not a hotel or resort experience, but it was good company, good fun, and getting to be out in nature for a few nights. And a lot of what made it possible was the fact that it was a public park, so that the pricing was shockingly affordable. And everywhere we went in the park, we found these plaques with dedications and historic markers talking about the CCC. So who or what was the CCC? The Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC, existed in the United States from 1933 to 1942. It was part of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal that was intended to help citizens with relief in the throes of the longest, deepest, and most widespread depression of the 20th century. In the U.S., recovery from the Depression began in early 1933, and by 1940, unemployment was still at about 15%. However, as high as that was, it was down from the high in 1933, which was a whopping 25%. And the CCC, specifically, was intended to alleviate that problem. Roosevelt had served as governor of New York, which had hosted a similar program on a smaller scale, called the Temporary Emergency Relief Administration, or TERRA. During the first half of the 1900s, the focus for employment was primarily on cis men, and lists of the unemployed were culled to find candidates to work for improving existing reforestation areas. The first year of TERRA employed more than 25,000 New Yorkers for paid conservation work, And in 1933, then-President Roosevelt proposed a full-scale national program. In a statement, he wrote, quote, I propose to create the CCC to be used in complex work, not interfering with normal employment, and confining itself to forestry, the prevention of soil erosion, flood control, and similar projects. I call your attention to the fact that this type of work is of definite practical value, not only through the prevention of great present financial loss, but also as a means of creating future national wealth. Roosevelt envisioned that a quarter of a million men would be supplied with meals, housing, workwear, and medical care for working in national forests and other government lands under the Emergency Conservation Work Act, ECW. And on April 5, 1933, he issued Executive Order 6101 to create the CCC and appointed a director, Robert Fetchner, who was a former labor union official. Fetchner was chosen very purposefully because the idea of the CCC rubbed some people the wrong way. Today, when we think of social welfare programs, we generally think of opposition from the capitalist class, people who want to use philanthropy to increase their individual private control and decision-making around who is and is not deserving of assistance. They oppose the people making these decisions for themselves and using what, in theory, is a representative government that works to implement the welfare of the people. 
This, even though our federal government is empowered to, quote, promote the general welfare, unquote. The CCC enjoyed broad public popularity and today is often considered to be one of the most successful of Roosevelt's New Deal programs. The organization eventually planted more than three and a half billion trees and constructed trails and shelters in more than 800 parks across the U.S. during the only nine years it existed. The CCC was responsible for over half the reforestation, public and private, done in the nation's history. More than 700 new state parks were established through the CCC program. It played a key role in shaping the modern national and state park systems, like the one I was going back to every year. However, there was pushback against the CCC, and the pushback Roosevelt was getting was coming from the trade unions, many of whom were already skilled, but also facing unemployment. They opposed the training of unskilled workers when so many of their own were also out of work. They additionally opposed Army involvement in the CCC and were concerned that it could lead to state control of labor. The Army was involved in supervising the camps and also helping to build the barracks to replace the tents that were initially set up to serve as shelters in the early stages of the program. But there was no military training involved, and in fact, military leadership expressed concerns about using resources domestically in this capacity and how that could impact military readiness in the event that the resources were needed for military action in the future. However, the CCC ultimately proved useful to the military since they could assess performance of regular and reserve officers based on performance in administering the CCC camps and operations. Additionally, the CCC was used as a model to help the Army develop wartime mobilization plans for training camps. This is why Roosevelt strategically selected men with labor connections to help oversee the project. In addition to choosing Robert Fetchner, who had been vice president of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers as director of the Corps, he also selected William Green, who was head of the American Federation of Labor. Green was actually provided on-site access to the first camp to reassure him that there would be no job training beyond simple manual labor. Skilled labor, I should note, was not excluded from CCC work, and in fact, the CCC did employ skilled foresters and craftsmen. The CCC enrolled unskilled and unemployed men between 18 to 25 who came from families on government assistance. Each worker received $30 in payment per month for his services, which translates to a little over $600 today. The program also provided them with housing, food, clothing, medical care, and even recreational opportunities such as movies, libraries, and sports equipment. They were required to send most of that salary back to support their families, and they were required to sign up for at least six months. They could also re-enlist for up to two years. Supplying food was particularly difficult. When the men first arrived at conditioning camps, they received regular army rations but many of them were coming from distressed families and were undernourished, so the rations were increased by 5%. By the time they were sent to the work camps, supervisors reported that they, quote, were consuming unheard of quantities of food, unquote, and gaining about 12 pounds apiece for the first two months. In addition to receiving supplemental basic and vocational education while they served, It was estimated that almost 60,000 men who joined actually learned to read and write while in the camps. Following protests by veterans groups, the program was amended to serve veterans as well, including higher pay and supervisory positions made available to those who entered the Corps with a certificate from the Veterans Administration. The requirements for veterans were also more flexible with regard to age and medical status as well. It should be noted here that the CCC was not immune to white supremacy, and while minority applicants were accepted, their living spaces were segregated, and, as gently noted earlier, women were outright excluded from the program entirely. The only push I found for including women was that Eleanor Roosevelt suggested that some of the 200,000 unhoused women in the nation should also be included in the work. She sent her idea to the first woman cabinet member, Frances Perkins, in the Labor Department, but it never materialized. If you Google historic photos of the CCC, they are nearly entirely populated with young white men. It wasn't always that way, though. During these early years, the Democratic Party was pretty well white supremacists. 
That all changed during the next few decades with demographic shifts, but at this time, in the early 1930s, conservative, solid South white Democrats in Congress insisted on racial segregation. And as a result, most New Deal programs, including the CCC, were racially segregated. And overall, because of discrimination by white officials at the local and state levels, black communities in the South did not receive as many benefits from New Deal programs. In the first few weeks of operation, CCC camps in the North were actually integrated. But by the summer of 1935, all camps were segregated, although each CCC laborer received equal pay and housing. This, however, was not the case with CCC leadership, and despite black leaders lobbying to secure leadership roles, adult white men held those roles in all of the camps. Director Fetchner, the man Roosevelt had appointed, refused to appoint black workers into any supervisory positions, except as education directors in the all-black camps. There was also a separate CCC division for Native American tribes known as the IECW or the CCCID. The work was similar but restricted to Native American men from reservations, and the work often occurred near the reservations where they were from. These camps did not provide housing, but rather allowed whole families to move from worksite to worksite, providing a rental allowance for each move. In 1933, the CCCID employed about half the male heads of households from the South Dakota Sioux reservations. The work often included improving infrastructure on the reservations themselves, such as building schools and roads. The model for the work in the CCCID was to provide self-governance of the workers and projects, and this particular branch of the CCC did include more skilled training in things like carpentry, truck driving, mechanics, and more. In 1941, the National Defense Vocational Training Act was passed, and after completing courses through that program, graduates were guaranteed employment in defense. 85,000 Native Americans enrolled 24,000 later served in the military, and 40,000 were employed supporting the war effort in cities outside of reservations. Imperfect as it was, by the time the CCC hit its peak in the fall of 1935, more than half a million men were housed in nearly 3,000 camps. And throughout the nine years of the Corps' existence, it is estimated that about 5% of the U.S. population, or 3 million men, participated in the work done by the Corps. The CCC did more than just plant trees and build parks, though. Included in their mission were things like building bridges and fire lookout towers, building roads, managing flood control through irrigation efforts, drainage, and dams. Their work included both fire prevention efforts as well as actual firefighting, and their work helped manage insect populations, reducing disease. Their efforts were also, in some cases, helpful to wildlife, improving waterways. They were also used for emergency efforts, and all of this was publicly funded work that employed citizens in useful efforts that still benefit us to this day, nearly 100 years later. I mentioned seeing the plaques and dedications around the park. Those types of markers can be found in many areas where their work has benefited the nation. Their work makes it possible for citizens like me to explore state and national park systems across the country. The CCC became a model for future conservation programs. More than 100 present-day core programs operate at local, state, and national levels. The National Civilian Community Corps, part of AmeriCorps, a national service program, enrolls 18 to 24 year olds for 10 month stints working for nonprofit and governmental organizations, often with an environmental purpose. But in 1942, Congress discontinued funding for the CCC. From 1939 to 1940, Congress transferred control of the program from the military to federal agencies within the executive branch. The 5,000 reservists were transferred to civil service, eliminating military ranks and titles. In 1940, with war ongoing in Europe, the CCC projects began to be diverted to national defense. Also that year, the agency branched out to do more than just relief efforts. The CCC was quite possibly one of the most popular New Deal programs, but it was never authorized as a permanent agency. And as the Depression era began to lift, and employment opportunities became more available, 
conscription into the military was also happening. This left fewer young men to take positions. And after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt instructed all federal programs to emphasize the war effort. Outside of some firefighting responsibilities, the CCC was moved to military bases where they helped with construction. Congress ceased funding for the CCC in 1942, and transfer of assets to the War and Navy Departments began. The Labor Federal Secretary Appropriation Act that same year began the liquidation of the program, which concluded in 1943. The camps served as locations for conscientious objectors to perform civilian public service to assist in, quote, work of national importance, unquote. And much to our national shame, Some of the other remaining camps were used for internment of Japanese, German, and Italian Americans who were held under the Western Defense Command's, quote, enemy alien control program, unquote, along with Axis prisoners of war. And that was the end of the era of the Civilian Conservation Corps. But the more I learned, the more I wondered why. It seemed we had a goal of reintegrating people into private for-profit work, but why? If we can employ a standing military and National Guard, why not a standing Civilian Conservation Corps? In fact, it leaves me wondering why anything a citizen needs to survive can't be handled as a public entity. If you've ever been to a CCC park or seen some of the amazing work done by the organization, you know that it shows what people can do when they're coordinated and contributing to a social benefit. Sure, the men were paid, but it's hardly the case that they were doing this to make money. They needed to survive, and they showed up to do the work and be productive. And their efforts were incredibly successful without a profit motive, simply with a goal of public welfare. The welfare of the people living and working in the camps and their families, and the welfare of the public, whose public lands and infrastructure these citizens were creating. There's a narrative in the U.S. that says that we can't use the government to get things done, that we can't have robust public systems to address public welfare, that nothing can be done well without a profit motive or going through private enterprise. But the CCC shows that to be the lie it's always been. The idea we can't do these things is garbage. We absolutely can. We're told people shouldn't expect government handouts and that private enterprise is required to meet our needs. The CCC exists in our own history as an example of an imperfect yet wildly successful program that evolved over nine years to create a lasting legacy that is still standing almost a century later and that will still be here long after I'm gone. It was locally sourced citizen labor that supported positive efforts that benefited us all. The only thing holding us back from meeting the needs of our whole population, basically governing ourselves, doing the work ourselves, taking responsibility for ourselves as a citizen and resident collective that prioritizes the common good as our primary focus and motivation, is our belief that we can't do it. But we know we can do it because we did do it. It worked on a small state scale. It worked on a national scale. In other words, Not only do we know it can work, but we have proven that it's a scalable model. It works at both smaller and larger scales. The capitalist class tells us that it's people who are struggling, who are expendable, who are superfluous and unnecessary, who are leeches on our society. We are taught from an early age to believe that using our government to organize and orchestrate systems that benefit society is being irresponsible and that expecting a government to function for the benefit of all its citizens is wanting a handout. But the CCC shows that when citizens use the government to get things done, we are not leeches and we do get things done. We are productive and beneficial and capable of taking care of ourselves without private enterprise and without capitalists there to siphon profit off our efforts. Using the government for social welfare is not lazy or paternalistic. It is, in fact, what a government should do. Be there to ensure the general welfare. It is the people taking care of themselves as a society and a citizenry. And if people can use the government to get things done and take care of themselves, then what purpose does the capitalist class serve? From where I sit, 
These folks seem like the actual leeches on society, not the CCC volunteers who took advantage of social welfare programs and gave us back useful, lasting infrastructure. Capitalists are inserting an entire parallel system of governance that is unelected and that siphons tax dollars and exploits workers by creating artificial deprivation called austerity. As mentioned in a prior episode, we have about half a million unhoused people and 17 million vacant homes. The only reason housing insecurity is such a problem is, as someone put it recently, because housing isn't built to house people. It's built to make a profit. And if it can't turn a profit, we'd rather watch it sit vacant than use it to help a person or a family in need. But what if we had a CCC program that was tasked with building housing for people to live in, to actually house people, not just for profit? We'd be told we can't do that because it would compete with the housing industry. And there it is again. Profit over people. Money over lives. Capitalism standing in the way of making sure this nation's population is okay. Even though none of the people we'd be housing could possibly afford any of these homes built for profit, which is why they sit vacant in the face of so much citizen and resident need. Do we really need the for-profit housing industry at all? Why? Why can't we just house ourselves as a society if we need housing? That's rhetorical. We can. So I suppose what I'm really asking is, why don't we? The 17 million houses can continue to sit empty, and the half a million citizens who need housing, we just provide it. The same way we provided parks and bridges and roads without private enterprise, we did it for ourselves. I wondered if there was a flaw in that idea, and when I googled to see who else had thought of it, I wasn't alone. In October 2020, Wired Magazine published an article by Matt Simon. It was literally titled, The Case for Reviving the Civilian Conservation Corps. And in it, he does just that, makes a case for revival. He mentions that it has support across the aisle and that we definitely have a need. He even makes recommendations for specific projects they could take on. He talks about local state projects being done by volunteers and suggests these same jobs could be paid government work jobs. In November 2021, The Economist included an article entitled, Joe Biden Wants to Revive FDR's Conservation Corps. In December 2022, Lancaster Farming, a farming e-zine, posted their support for a CCC branch that operates on farm labor. Other articles were featured or amplified in outlets like Mother Jones, NPR, and even a few local state-level outlets. I also found support even at religious and evangelical sites. Again, reviving the CCC appears to have broad appeal. So where are we with that? Well, apparently U.S. Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania heard the call and took up the gauntlet. In July 2021, he posted a statement at his political page entitled, Casey Introduces Legislation to Renew Job Creation, Revitalize Civilian Conservation Corps. It talks about his vision of what a modern corps could be, with a focus on farming and climate change response. I'm actually kind of ashamed that this is something I'd support, but I had no idea there was even an initiative to revive it. But when I look to see where this bill is at, how it's progressing... All I can find is that in July 2021, it was read twice and then turned over to the Finance Committee. Maybe it's time to start asking our legislators what the status is on this bill. The House version is H.R. 5191. The Senate version, the one I'm describing here, is S. 2414. Again, sponsored by Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania. And it wouldn't be right to talk about this without talking about the concept of work as a human right. I would say right to work, except that in some U.S. states that phrase is already in use, and it's not very pretty. The AFL-CIO describes right to work as, quote, the name for a policy designed to take away rights from working people, 
Backers of right-to-work laws claim that these laws protect workers against being forced to join a union. The reality is that federal law already makes it illegal to force someone to join a union. The real purpose of right-to-work laws is to tilt the balance toward big corporations and further rig the system at the expense of working families. These laws make it harder for working people to form unions and collectively bargain for better wages, benefits, and working conditions. Unquote. What I'm trying to describe is more along the lines of what's in the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where it says in Articles 23 and 24, Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. Everyone, without any discrimination, has the right to equal pay for equal work. Everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for themselves and their families an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. Everyone has the right to form and to join trade unions for the protection of their interests. Everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitation of working hours and periodic holidays with pay. If the United States had this encoded as a right, something like a standing CCC could be used to ensure employment. And again, I'm not sure this model is only useful as a standing civilian corps. I would think it's possible to serve any national citizen need using this model. When I say history erased in the title, It doesn't mean it's a closely guarded secret. In fact, I suspect most of us who came up through U.S. public schools have heard about the CCC in lessons about the New Deal. But just as was the case with Henry Ford and George Washington Carver in a prior episode, what's said tells us as much as what's not said in a classroom. Saying that the CCC was a good program that served us well and then it wasn't needed anymore is just a way of cutting off the natural questions that follow about why such programs should disappear just because for-profit jobs are available. I'm not sold that government can't compete with private enterprise. If we can do the job using the materials and people power at our immediate disposal, why would we, or should we, pay more for it? Why not do it ourselves? And why allow people who exploit us for profit to convince us that we can't, or that competing with them is a bad thing. The CCC was a good thing, and the idea of reviving it excites me. As always, though, this is just a piece of history that still has relevance today in many ways. Not just the legacy of the former core, but the potential of a more modern version of the core with new and more relevant missions. That's it for this episode of At Home in My Head, exploring experience and meaning in individuals and the broader society. Like and subscribe if you enjoy these talks. And in the meantime, stay safe, be well, and never stop exploring.